Thameslink services have been operating through London since 1988. They provide one of only two mainline train services through the city. There's no denying that it's a very useful route, even if you do find yourself running afoul of engineering works at the weekends. But the route is only possible because of a railway that had been built more than a century before and had been abandoned for over a decade. This is the story of the Snow Hill Tunnel. The story begins with a company called the London Chatham and Dover Railway. This company, as its name implies, was a railway from London to the south coast. It was not a wealthy company at all, and it was competing with the South Eastern Railway for passenger traffic. But the general attitude of Victorian railway builders was, who dares wins. Companies gambled on new lines, even if they couldn't really afford it. And shareholders got annoyed with railways that were unambitious. With this in mind, the London, Chatham and Dover built a line from Herne Hill up to the edge of the city. They wanted a terminus in the city proper, but they were also looking further afield. In the early 1860s, a railway was being built that would change the world the Metropolitan Railway. This would form the first ever underground railway and would give the English language the word metro. But as well as helping commuters cross the city, it also connected with a number of other railway companies. This allowed those companies to run trains between each other's lines and also to run trains beneath the very heart of the city. They built a number of goods depots, including one beneath the famous market at Smithfield. The Metropolitan was a success, so much so that they couldn't cope with the volume of traffic, and they made plans to build an additional set of tracks between King's Cross and Farringdon, and extend all four tracks to Moorgate. These extra tracks were known as the City Widened Lines, and were intended purely for the use of other companies. They opened in 1866. When the plans were announced, the London Chatham and Dover looked at them and said, Me too. So while the Metropolitan were working on the so-called city-widened lines, the LCDR were digging their way north. Originally, their idea was to build a conventional railway on a viaduct. This was something that various authorities were opposed to. In 1846, a royal commission had been set up that made it all but impossible to build surface railways through central London. That's literally why the underground was underground. Farringdon Ward insisted that the London, Chatham and Dover do the same, which was a problem, because they were already building their terminus at Ludgate Hill on a viaduct, and it would be a heck of a dive under the ground. Then there was the question of money. Samuel Smiles, political campaigner and self-help book writer, argued that there was no way the London, Chatham and Dover could afford to build and run such a line. It wasn't an unreasonable suggestion. As I mentioned, the LCDR did not have a lot of money. They were paying over £120,000 a year in interest charges alone, and their profits were around 4000 And no, I didn't miss a zero out there. They started to get cold feet. They considered simply terminating at Blackfriars Bridge, south of the river. They also considered setting a separate company up to build the line through the city, to be named the Ludgate Station and Junction Railway. In the end, it was other companies that saved the day. The London and South Western Railway was a southern company that wanted to get north, and the Great Northern Railway was a northern company that wanted to get south. Both put money forward. In 1865, the station at Ludgate Hill opened. This was very basic and not really suitable for a city terminus. The LCDR just couldn't afford anything better. Not with a tunnel to dig. On the 1st of January, 1866, the Snow Hill Tunnel opened. It ran from Ludgate Hill to Farringdon, where it connected with the Metropolitan. The incline at the end of the tunnel was so sharp that extra locomotives were stationed at the bottom to help trains up. There were also catch points, points designed to deliberately derail rolling stock in the event of a runaway. Now, when you think of railways in London, you think of commuter traffic, but that's not what Snow Hill Tunnel was for. The LCDR's big argument to Parliament was that it would take traffic off the roads. We think of London as being a gridlocked city now, but it's nothing compared to what it was like in the Victorian era. The line served Smithfield Market and, the Chatham boys argued, it could carry fruit, vegetables, meat, live animals and manure that would otherwise go by cart. 
Once the line opens, they also opened coal depots at Clapham and Camberwell, as trains now had access to the coal fields of the North and West. The Great Northern and Midland Railways also built depots in South London, well off their turf, but now accessible to them. In 1871, the LCDR and Metropolitan joined forces to build a curve to Moorgate. In 1874, the LCDR opened a new station at the end of the dive down from Ludgate Hill. The station was here and it was called Snow Hill. Despite the name, it was anything but snowy, with the platforms being so smoky that the station had to be whitewashed on a weekly basis. In 1912, it was renamed Hoban Viaduct Low Level, being more or less adjacent to Hoban Viaduct Station, which had been opened in 1874. Hoban Viaduct Station is a whole other story. Some other time. Ironically, the underground, the very thing that had provided the impetus for the Snow Hill Tunnel, would be its downfall, at least for passenger services. As the underground network expanded in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it poached passengers from the main line railways. The underground trains were fast, direct and powered by electricity, while the main line trains were smoky, slow and took some rather rambling routes to get to the city centre. For short distance travel from South London, the one area where the underground feared to tread, electric trams offered a cheap alternative that the locals enthusiastically took advantage of. In 1899, the LCDR was forced to amalgamate, sort of, with the South Eastern Railway. Which was again ironic, because the South Eastern had been their rivals. The two companies would still exist, but under the umbrella of the South Eastern and Chatham Railway. The erosion of the line's popularity really started to bite in the first decade of the 20th century. The Midland Railway and the Great Northern Railway both withdrew their services. In 1916, Hoban Viaduct Low Level was closed and so the cross-city passenger services ceased. There would be a few trains at the old station, but only due to mistakes by signalmen, which of course would never happen today. Yet during the First World War, the line found a new purpose. With the incredible demands of war traffic, more freight trains went through Snow Hill Tunnel than ever before. The same would happen during the Second World War. As late as 1962, there were 90 freight trains a day running through. It was technology that did for Snow Hill Tunnel in the end. The tunnel had been built in an age of relatively small steam locomotives. By the late 1960s, trains through Snow Hill were exclusively hauled by diesel locomotives. British Railways, the nationalised railway network, were still figuring these new-fangled diesel locomotives out in the early 60s. But by 1969, more powerful, more reliable and longer-range locomotives were available. Rather than route trains to a London depot, change engines, send them through Snow Hill to another London depot and change engines again, they would just send trains the long way around. Which they still do. For passenger lines into London, this was good news because it meant more slots for commuter trains. But Snow Hill was not a passenger line, so in 1969 it was closed. In 1971 the track was pulled up. But it wouldn't lie empty for long. Well, relatively speaking. In the early 80s the Thameslink scheme was mooted and Snow Hill was a vital part of it. One suggestion in those early days was to build a new Snow Hill station north of the old one, but in the end what they went for was a new station, more or less, on the site of the old one. This was initially named St Paul's, but is now known as City Thameslink. Instead of the rather sudden dive into the tunnel, a new incline was built from Blackfriars to the new station, ploughing through the site of the long-closed Ludgate Hill and necessitating the raising of the road level by two metres. This section opened in 1990. Even now it's still quite steep, but fortunately modern trains are a lot lighter than steam age goods trains. The new track was laid in 1986, the tunnel was reopened in 1988, and passenger services commenced. Or should that be recommenced? So, Snow Hill Tunnel serves a new purpose as part of the Thameslink core. An important purpose. And all because the London, Chatham and Dover Railway took a gamble 160 years ago.
Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your much appreciated support. You are the freight train to my otherwise purposeless tunnel. And I will see you all again very soon. Cheerio.